One of the problems that comes out of peak oil and later peak gas is that energy availability is not the whole story. It also depends what form energy is in because we have built our societies to have dependencies on energy in particular forms. So oil, for instance, provides us with our source of liquid fuels, particularly for transport. And when we have problems with oil supply, we are going to have a liquid fuels crisis. For this reason, we often look to biofuels as able to provide alternative sources. But one of the major problems with biofuels is the net energy argument, where a lot of these biofuels actually are energy losing propositions. There are other ways as well of trying to produce liquid fuels. You can make liquid fuel from coal, but again, you end up with a net energy problem. Coal, if you use it to burn in a power station, the net energy, as long as you have a reasonably accessible coal mine, the net energy is not too bad. But you reduce that enormously if you have to process that into a liquid fuel. So we are going to have major problems with liquid fuels. A lot of the energy alternatives that people look to as being potential solutions for the future don't produce liquid fuels at all. They produce electricity. Now, we do have an electricity system, but it really isn't designed to cope with the kind of decentralized electricity production that people are imagining the future might look like. There's also a major net energy argument with renewable sources of energy to produce electricity as well. And it's important to point out that there's a concept called receding horizons that comes from the enormous dependence of renewable energy infrastructure on the availability of fossil fuels. So as the price of, of, of oil goes up, all the fossil fuel that goes into the production of solar panels and wind turbines, for instance, pushes up the price of those as well. So those can become less and less affordable over time. And they, the net energy is typically quite low. So you're having to put a lot of energy in the form of fossil fuels into producing renewable infrastructure, and you are getting a, a surplus out, but the surplus is relatively small. So a lot of effort goes into producing electricity from renewable sources. Not an enormous amount comes out. But the major problems from the point of view of using this for a power system are that renewable sources like that are intermittent and they tend to be very highly distributed. So they're not concentrated sources of power. Our power systems have been built on a central station model where you have large thermal power plants typically, or sometimes a large hydro dam, a large source of energy that you then run a high voltage line from to where your demand is. When you have instead very distributed diffuse sources of energy, that it produces a requirement for a lot more infrastructure to carry that power from where it is to where you need it. And that is a that becomes a major problem. It's very difficult to use that kind of distributed system with only the grid infrastructure that we already have, because if you only have a few sources, large sources of power, you have a few lines. If you have to have wind turbines in all sorts of places, you're going to have to have a lot more lines. We don't really have enough infrastructure for that. Now, these are intermittent sources of power, unless you're talking about hydro, of course, which in Sweden you have a, a lot of, and that will serve you well. But if you have wind and solar, they only produce power at certain times. With solar, it's more predictable than, than wind. But when you have intermittent sources of power, this creates problems for power grid stability. So you have to have control over supply and demand. You have to balance supply and demand in real time to be able to maintain uh, the functioning of a power grid. It has to function within certain parameters for frequency control, for voltage control. Now, intermittent, small-scale, non-dispatchable renewable energy does not give you any ability to control any of these parameters. They, they function within the parameters set 
within the broader system, but those parameters depend on these larger sources of power. It's adjusting the speed of large turbines, for instance, that gives you, that gives you frequency control in an AC system. Without these larger systems, these larger power plants, you can't run a stable functioning grid on only small intermittent sources. Another issue that you have is that if you have long power lines and you're trying to bring in renewable power at a small scale on these small feeder lines, they tend to be low voltage, high current, the losses are proportional to the square of the current. When you send a small amount of energy over a long distance at low voltage, the losses are very high. This, of course, means the net energy of using these as energy sources is, is actually even lower than you would originally think. So it's not just the energy that goes into making, say, a wind turbine, it's all the energy that goes into producing the grid infrastructure that you need to bring that energy somewhere. It's all the losses that are inherent in using that power source in that way. In some ways you can consider uh, using or putting renewable energy like that into a grid system as somewhat an abuse of renewable energy. Renewable energy for electricity in that way is better used on site. Then you don't have a grid dependency. Your net energy will be considerably higher. But that doesn't help you if your wind is in one place and your demand is in another. That's what creates the grid dependency. And then we have to understand how power grids work. And that is something that people are typically not thinking about when they think of small-scale distributed systems. How you would manage that and still have what you would call a power grid. How do you supply very concentrated areas of demand with very diffuse intermittent sources of supply? There are far more complications in going down that route than people typically realize.